So welcome to the Canadian War Studies Association podcast, episode 4, Lord Barham, Captain Charles Middleton. The Royal Navy career of Charles Middleton spanned three wars, from the Seven Years' War to the American Revolution, through the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. During the Seven Years' War, Middleton, the future comptroller of the Navy, was a lowly frigate commander, sailing in the 28-gun HMS Emerald, where he spent four years countering French commerce privateers. After the Seven Years' War, Middleton seemed to have fulfilled his duty and was prepared to retire. Fate, however, ensured that Middleton would yet return to the centers of power and play an unexpected but decisive role in the Royal Navy's history. After his service in the Caribbean as a frigate commander and station administrator, Middleton went on to become a reformer and modernizer during the American Revolution as Comptroller of the Navy. Rear Admiral Middleton, raised to the peerage as Lord Barham, returned to power as Senior Naval Lord and eventually First Lord of the Admiralty at the time of Trafalgar in 1805. Middleton's legacy is as a far-sighted reformer and modernizer, at once pragmatic and controversial. As First Lord of the Admiralty, he established the position of First Sea Lord as the chief naval post on the board, thus setting the pattern for the 19th and 20th centuries. A relentless modernizer, yet a devout Tory, a disciplinarian who opposed slavery, Middleton's career certainly possessed its share of conflicts. Details about Middleton's important administrative career during three wars can be found in a number of sources, although the modern researcher will not find it better than that produced by Sir John Knox Lawton, his three volumes of the Barham Papers, published shortly before the First World War by the Navy Record Society. Charles Middleton was born at Leith, Edinburgh, on 14 October 1726. He was the second son of Robert Middleton and Helen Dundas. Helen was the great granddaughter of Robert Dundas, the Lord Arniston, while Robert, a descendant of Alexander Middleton, was living as a customs official in Bonas, West Lothian, Scotland. Charles Middleton joined the Navy at a young age, credited with service aboard the merchantman Loyal June in 1738, when he was only 12 years old. Middleton joined his first warship, prophetically HMS Sandwich of 90 guns, in April 1741, at the tender age of 14, and shortly afterward he followed its captain Meade to the Duke of 90 guns, before joining the 20-gun frigate Flamborough, under Captain Joseph Hamar on 21 November 1741 for service in North America and the West Indies. After four years of apprenticeship as a captain servant, midshipman, and master's mate aboard HMS Flamborough, and ten days before his 20th birthday, Middleton passed his lieutenant's examination in October 1745, and the following month was appointed to the fifth-rate HMS Chesterfield of 40 guns patrolling the channel and the coast of Sierra Leone. Middleton, 22 years old, was there in 1748 when he was marooned at the notorious slave trading site, the Cape Corso Fortress in Ghana. Middleton, along with the Chesterfield's captain, O'Brien Dudley, the master, second lieutenant, purser, surgeon, and 11 other men, were stranded by a mutiny amongst the ship's crew and remaining officers. The mutineers were led by a buccaneering carpenter's mate named John Place, with help from the supposedly drunken first lieutenant, Samuel Coachman. The loyal boatswain, however, was able to retake the ship, arresting the mutineers. The boatswain was able to bring the Chesterfield to English Harbour in Antigua, where it was reunited with the stranded officers on 7 March 1749. Middleton and company aboard, now under Captain James Campbell, returned to England, arriving at Spithead on 14 June 1749. Middleton was put on half pay and sent ashore the following month. There he remained, until transferred to a dockside assignment aboard HMS Coladoon, 74 guns, in June 1752. Back on half pay in November, he was subsequently transferred to what would become a familiar ship, HMS Anson, then under Captain Charles Holmes, a fourth rate of 60 guns built in 1747. In January 1753, Middleton, now 26 years old, was thus acting in the capacity of second lieutenant aboard a large ship of the line. Anson's first lieutenant at this time was one Richard Kempenfeldt, later the Rear Admiral Kempenfeldt. Middleton was briefly transferred to the Monarch of 74 guns, but was then back aboard Anson in July 1754. Middleton succeeded Kempenfeldt as first lieutenant aboard Anson in January 1755, and in March of that year, Lieutenant Middleton was found to be recruiting sailors in the Bristol Channel, while aboard Princess Augusta. While Britain's relations with France were deteriorating, Middleton, aboard the Anson under Captain Robert Mann, was dispatched as part of Vice Admiral Edward Boscoen's fleet of 11 ships of the line to blockade the St. Lawrence. 
although, it being 1755, war had not yet been declared against France. Bosquin intercepted a detached French squadron of three and captured two 64 gunships, El Cid and Lice, but missed a third of the Dauphin Royale in the fog off the Newfoundland banks, June 8th to 9th. Anson cruised off Louisbourg in Halifax, then returned to England in October 1755, eventually docking at Portsmouth in March of 1756. Anson, along with Bristol of 50 guns and Harwich, also 50 guns, were now dispatched to the West Indies as part of the outbound convoy with 17 other merchant ships. The convoy departed England on 27 April and arrived at St. John's Road, Antigua on 12 July 1756. That same month, Menorca fell as a result of Admiral Byng's failed relief attempt stemming from the Battle of Port Mahon, 20 May 1756. During 1755-6, relations soured between England's North American colonies and the French settlers in Canada and their Native American allies. A struggle for control of the Ohio River Valley soon revealed the tenuous nature of the status quo peace. The Treaty of Al la Chapelle, which had ended the War of Austrian Succession in 1748, was tested on a number of occasions, first in 1755, when General Braddock's force was ambushed, then again in India, where Lieutenant Colonel Robert Clive and the British East India Company continued their swashbuckling campaign of conquest, capturing Calcutta in January 1757, then winning the decisive battle at Plessé on 23 June 1757. War in Europe was renewed when Prussia invaded Saxony in 1756, prompting Austria to declare war on Frederick II the following year. Britain declared war against France on 18 May, and this pushed Austria into coalition against Britain with Prussia. As the British monarchy originated from the electorate of Hanover, England joined Prussia and Portugal against the powerful coalition now consisting of France, Austria, Russia, Sweden, Poland, and, after 1762, Spain. Frederick the Great won his major maneuver victories against the overwhelming enemy coalition forces at Rosbeck and Luthien in November and December 1757, followed by the victory against Russia at Zondorf in August 1758, dealing a serious repulse to Britain's to the initial Grand Alliance war effort. As a result, Britain's founding of the funding of the Prussian effort increased between 1757 and 1758 by nearly a factor of 10 to 1.8 million pounds sterling. For Britain, the war began with a series of reversals, notably at Menorca, where Admiral Byng was unable to win the victory at Port Mahon. France's Louisbourg Citadel, in present-day Nova Scotia, however, was captured in July 1758. These tremendous events were followed by the capture of Quebec itself after the victory at the Plains of Abraham on 13 September 1759, accompanied by suitable naval victories at Lagos, 18-19 August, under Boscoen, and famous battle at Quiberon Bay, 20 November, under Hawk, during the victorious Annas Mirabalis. Unfortunately, Frederick's subsequent reversals against the Russians in 1759 at Kunersdorf led to Berlin's capture, but Frederick re maintained his defense against France and Austria, defeating the Austrians at Liegnitz in August and again at Torgau in November 1760. Britain, for its part, eventually abandoned the alliance, seeking a separate peace in 1762 to consolidate its colonial gains a move that Frederick would not forget when Britain came looking for European allies during the American Revolutionary War. With the major struggle taking place in Canada and Europe, the Caribbean was at first a sideshow. The Royal Navy's defense of its Caribbean trade had been arranged as a layered blockade and interdiction operation. The two station commanders, based at Jamaica and Antigua, were provided with small squadrons of 50 or 60 gun ships for blockading the enemy's naval bases at Saint Domingo in Spain and Martinique in France. Heavy Royal Navy frigates of 30 to 40 guns would sail windward of Antigua and Barbados, seeking privateers. Lastly, 20-gun frigates and all lesser sloops, brigs, and corvettes covered the inter-island communications, primarily around the Leeward Islands. In 1756, the Jamaican station was under the command of Rear Admiral George Townsend, with three of the line and four frigates. The Leeward Island station was commanded by Rear Admiral Franklin, with an additional three of the line and four or five frigates. When the elder Pitt took power during his brief 1756 to 1757 term under the Duke of Devonshire, he reshuffled the Admiralty, using Boscoen to offset Anson, who at that time was the First Lord of the Admiralty. Pitt also doubled the size of the Caribbean fleets, 
while appointing new commanders. Rear Admiral Thomas Coates, with seven of the line and ten or so frigates, was ordered to Jamaica, while Commodore John Moore was ordered to the Leeward Islands with three of the line, two fifties and three forties, and five frigates. Middleton, still aboard the warship Anson, was ordered to Antigua with Commodore Moore's fleet. Middleton was now 30 years old, and remained aboard Anson until 26 February 1757, when he was promoted to commander and appointed to the sloop Speaker of 12 guns to cruise in the Leeward Islands. There is some confusion regarding his command at this exact point, as he was simultaneously listed as commander of the Blandford as acting captain, as of 26 February to 28 March, while also having command of the sloop Saltash, briefly. It is clear from the sources, however, that Commander Middleton's position would involve dockyard work, while appreciating the administrative aspects of running a trade defense operation. Middleton was promoted captain in July 1758, and took command of the newly constructed Barbados of 12 guns. Middleton's role during this time was a small but critical part of the Admiralty's vast world system. Based at English Harbor Antigua, Captain Middleton was left in charge of anti-privateering operations, while Commodore Moore conducted amphibious landings against Martinique and Guadeloupe. Middleton was a natural administrator, and thus he oversaw trade as it massed at Antigua in preparation for its biannual convoy across the Atlantic. These large convoys, sailing at the beginning of June and July, of which the first in June 1757 totaled 170 ships, and was valued at over 2 million pounds. Although fairly secure from interception, these convoys were generally uninsured. Individual merchant ships, however, not to mention the inter-island and coastal trade, were all potential prey for French privateers sorting from Guadeloupe and Martinique, or crossing the Atlantic from the windward. Over 1.4 thousand trade ships were captured by French privateers in the West Indies over the course of the war. Captain Middleton found himself in a similar position, in fact, to Captain Horatio Nelson, who would likewise be appointed as a frigate commander to Antigua 27 years later. While captain of the Barbados in October 1758, Middleton wrote to a merchant representing the local chamber of commerce at St. Christopher's, St. Kitts, regarding a proposed scheme for the defense of the islands. The plan involved two warships of 40 guns, two of 20 guns, and eight brigs of 16 guns, supported by two sloops of 10 guns each. According to Middleton's recommendations, these warships would be split between Barbados and Antigua, with two frigates stationed at each, and three brigs at the former, five brigs plus two sloops at the latter. Captain Middleton's detailed summary of the defense scheme identified what he believed to be the optimum arrangement for trade defense, observing that the area around Barbados would be relatively easily protected, although, quote, Antigua, St. Christopher's, Nevis, Montserrat, Jamaica, and C, end quote, were more difficult to predict, considering the numerous sailing routes between the islands. In January 1759, writing from his new command, Arundel, Middleton believed the entire station could be covered by two ship of the line, four frigates, three brigs, and two sloops, with reserves to relieve those forces as needed. Middleton was keen to use the heavier frigates to cover the routes to and from Martinique, Mary Galette, and Guadeloupe, so as to interrupt French prize captures there. Middleton was in fact executing a portion of Commodore Moore's grand scheme, which based on his predecessor, Rear Admiral Franklin, involved the main squadron covering Martinique and the passage to Fort Royal in St. Pierre, capital of the French Lesser Antilles, while the various cruisers and frigates covered the islands in search for privateers, of which 25 were taken in the first 10 months of Moore's command, at least one of those actually by Middleton himself in the Barbados. Captain Moore's command had now been built up to 10 ship of the line and 6,000 troops under General Hobson, with which he might sortie to capture the French island bases and thus solve the privateer problem at source. An attempt to storm Martinique on 16 January 1759 had been repulsed when it was discovered that the island's defenses were too strong, and a result that the combined force mobilized instead against Guadeloupe. The result of this operation was a siege which lasted until May the 1st. The surrender of the island was then accepted by Brigadier John Barrington, who had taken command following General Hobson's death on 27 February. The result of this series of events, which cost the French Empire 80,000 hogsheads per annum in Guadeloupe sugar, 
prompted the dispatch of the Toulon squadron to the West Indies. French Admiral Lecou Sabrin's squadron, however, was intercepted as it left the Mediterranean by Admiral Boscawen, with the result that five of the French ships were lost or captured at the Battle of Lagos, 18 to 19 August, 1759. At Antigua, Middleton soon made post captain, and in March 1759, while the Guadalupe operation was underway, was appointed commander of the 1756 vintage 6th rate frigate HMS Arundel of 24 guns. Middleton, while cruising aboard the Arundel in November 1759, captured the slave transport Swift with more than 100 slaves on board. James Ramsey, Middleton's assistant surgeon, and Middleton himself were both appalled by the conditions on board, confirming Middleton's faith in abolition as the only just solution to the problem of the African slave trade. By December 1759, Captain Middleton had taken another four prizes, two merchants and two privateers. However, Arundel was now in poor condition with a damaged foremast, so Middleton returned to harbor. As Middleton built up the local flotillas, Command Commodore Moore was critiqued by the Barbados merchant community for not bothering to intercept the French squadron sent to relieve Guadeloupe during the siege of spring 1759, with the result that 175 or 180 sail of merchant ships had subsequently been captured and taken to Martinique to be sold off at Fort Royal or St. Pierre by the French. Middleton continued to busy himself with flotilla outfitting and defense arrangements, repeatedly emphasizing the need for more of the Bermudian-type brigs of 12 guns, such as HMS Speaker, Antigua, and Barbados, which, due to their armament and sailing qualities, Middleton believed especially suited for the Leeward Islands. These heavy brigs were superior to the French sloops and schooners, the brigs having captured 30 prizes on station by 1759. Middleton built off his predecessor's layered defense scheme. Convoys would handle the major cross-Atlantic trade, while local inter-island routes were best handled by brigs or convoyed with frigates when available. Middleton argued for a flying detachment of two powerful frigates or cruisers stationed off Barbados for actively hunting enemy privateers. Another group of frigates and sloops would provide a distant blockade off Martinique, thus surrounding the island's traffic, a critical consideration with the Dutch trade at St. Estucius, effectively circumventing the blockade, if not intercepted. The coronation of George III in 1761 provided an opportunity for a change in strategy, with the Caribbean stations increasingly becoming more important. William the Pitt the Elder, who had directed British strategy as Secretary of State for the Southern Department while acting as leader of the House under the Duke of Newcastle between June 1757 and 1761, was now displaced by the Earl of Butte, and Pitt resigned in October of that year. At Middleton's smaller scale of operations, in July 1760, he replaced the gout-stricken Captain Cornwall to command HMS Emerald of 28 guns, a prize taken in 1757. As Middleton's tour of duty at the Leeward Islands was coming to an end, Rear Admiral George Rodney was dispatched in, in October 1761 to accelerate the campaign of seizure and capture of the French Caribbean islands. In January 1762, the year Britain declared war on Spain in response to the Spanish alliance with the French, Rear Admiral Rodney took 16,000 soldiers under Major General Robert Monckton to Martinique and captured the island by coup de main. Rodney next dispatched Captain Augustus Harvey in the Dragon, a third rate, to St. Lucia, which Harvey proceeded to capture on 25 February 1762. With Spain now in the war, the next target was Havana. Rear Admiral Sir George Pocock and Lieutenant General George Keppel were dispatched from England with a fleet and 15,000 troops to break Spain's Cuban fortress. Lord Anson, who had administered the Navy during much of the war, had, however, died in June 1762 and thus was unable to witness the successful capture of Havana in August of that year, the culminating event for Britain in the Seven Years' War. Middleton, meanwhile, had returned to England. Emerald was paid off in October 1761 to be broken up. During the war, Middleton had captured 16 prizes while captaining the Emerald, five of which were enemy privateers. During his four years in the Caribbean, Middleton had demonstrated an aptitude for trade defense, blockade, ship construction, fitting, discipline, and naval administration. In March of 1762, Middleton was appointed captain of HMS Adventure of 32 guns, a fifth rate which had been recut from a fourth rate in 1758. 
Middleton was sent to patrol along the Channel and Normandy coast when the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Seven Years' War, was signed on 10 February 1763. As part of the negotiations, Guadeloupe, Saint Lucia, and Martinique, the former capital, the former captured in 1759 and the latter two in 1762 respectively, were returned to France. Canada, however, was ceded to Great Britain. Havana and Manila, both taken from Spain, were likewise returned in exchange for Florida and Menorca. With the war over, Middleton went on half pay until March 1762. In December 1761, at the age of 35, Charles Middleton married Margaret Gambier, a skilled painter and later an advocate for the abolition of slavery. Margaret was the daughter of Captain James Gambier, to whom Middleton was familiar through the connection of Captain Mead, whose sister Mary was Margaret's brother, excuse me, mother. Middleton had first served with Mead during their time aboard the Sandwich 20 years prior. On 18 September 1762, Margaret gave birth to Charles' only child, a daughter, Diana. Middleton, now retired from the service, declining a seagoing appointment on 2nd April 1763 to retreat to the hospitality of his wife, then living with her friend Elizabeth Bouveret at Teston in Kent. Margaret and Elizabeth were joined there after 1777 by Captain Middleton's former assistant surgeon from the Arundel, now a staunch abolitionist and priest, James Ramsey. Ramsey became a close friend of Mrs. Middleton and her circle, as well as private secretary to Charles, drafting many of his letters. It was the wealthy Elizabeth Bouveret, proprietor of Barham Court, who, upon her death in 1798, left to Charles Middleton the entire Teston estate, the source of his title as Lord Barham. Middleton remained in these pleasant surroundings for 12 years, until in May 1775, with the American Revolution underway, he joined HMS Ardent of 64 guns. Much as his efforts during the Caribbean operations had taught Middleton administrative duties, and thus he soon found himself running Chatham Dockyard as Commodore Mackenzie's assistant. By December 1775, Middleton was in communication with Lord Sandwich regarding ship fittings, amongst other dockyard matters. Middleton was writing his own standing orders by this point, his orders for Ardent, for example, focusing on proper logistics, discipline, gunnery, and duties. On 7 November 1776, Middleton was made captain of HMS Prince George, 90 guns, a new but decommissioned second rate built in 1772. Middleton was working this ship up for more than a year. One imagines Middleton regularly visiting the dockyard during 1777, when, in February 1778, he was transferred to the fourth-rate Jupiter of 50 guns, then under construction. Middleton was back on half pay on 22nd July 1778, when, following the death of Captain Maurice Suckling, Middleton was appointed Comptroller of the Navy by his friend, the First Lord of the Admiralty, John Montague, the fourth Earl of Sandwich. Middleton would be in this position for 12 years until he resigned in 1790. The Earl of Sandwich was one amongst a powerful circle of Middleton's friends, including Middleton's cousin, Henry Dundas, the Lord Melville, then the Lord Advocate of Scotland, along with George Germain, Secretary of the State for America. These were the men who, together with Lord North, would fail to contain the American Revolution in years to come. Middleton kept up a regular correspondence with Admiral Hood and Captains Young and Kempenfelt as well, who provided the Comptroller with intelligence and a brain trust to work out signaling tactics or new construction ideas. Middleton's marriage into the Gambier family further increased the reach of his network, and his brother-in-law was Vice Admiral James Gambier, Commander-in-Chief North America. Lady Middleton herself was highly respected by British society and was known to be friends with Samuel Johnson and James Boswell, amongst other men and women of letters. The devout and ascendant Middleton, soon Lord Commissioner, then First Lord of the Admiralty, was made Baronet Barham on 23 October 1781. The Lord Barham was occasionally at odds with his benefactor, Sandwich. As Comptroller, Middleton was responsible for the, st the statistical control of the Navy's dockyards, warships, and naval supply. Middleton mastered the Navy's supply accounts and advanced his schemes for improvement, such as roofing all of the dockyards, a difficult task that was not completed until the following century. When Norco was retaken on his watch on 4th February 1782, wartime policy occasionally led to cut corners However, as was demonstrated by Sandwich's efforts to provide copper sheathing to all the warships of the fleet. It was Middleton's budget method that produced the electrolytic action 
the electrolytic action that prenaturally aged the fleet's warships, which resulted in several significant defects, contributing to the loss of HMS Terrible and Royal George. The fleet was eventually recoppered at considerable expense with specially coated copper nails, effectively the French method of copper construction. As a result of his incessant centralizing drive for reform, Middleton's later career was not without its antagonists. First amongst these, the Vice Count Howe, Admiral First Lord from 1783 until 1788, who Middleton had worked with under Boscoin in 1755. Howe unfortunately opposed Middleton's reforms. Indeed, Middleton and Sandwich eventually fell out as well. Nevertheless, the Middleton-Sandwich administration, despite its travails and failures, would be remembered as one of those dynamic admiralty leadership combinations that so infrequently graced the office of state, comparable perhaps only to Sir John Fisher and Winston Churchill in 1914, or Francis, Francis Drake and Admiral Sir John Hawkins in 1588. Middleton was elected MP as a Tory for Rochester in 1784 and made Rear Admiral of the Red on 24 September 1787. Together with his old friend James Ramsay and Lady Middleton's associate, William Wilberforce, MP, Middleton advocated for the abolition of slavery and the slave trade, of which he had seen the worst during his naval career. Middleton, during this time, defeated his erstwhile opponent, Lord Howe, who was superseded by the brother Pitt, John, the Earl of Chatham, on 16 July 1788. Middleton was long frustrated in his efforts to get himself onto the Admiralty Board, however, and he resigned in March 1790. Margaret, the Lady Middleton, died two years later, on 10 October 1792, and Charles was left with Diana and her husband, Gerard. Middleton was now made Vice Admiral in February 1793, and then his wish was granted in 1794, and he joined the Admiralty as First Naval Lord, assigned Lord Spencer, until November 1795, when he was made full Admiral of the Blue. Middleton was out of the loop, however, as the Admiralty was under the control of another of Middleton's antagonists, Admiral Sir John Jervis, who, after his victory in February 1797, had become the Earl St. Vincent, who was now First Lord of the Admiralty in 1801. It was the intervention at this point of Middleton's friend, the leader of the new Tories, William Pitt, the Younger, who returned him to power. Middleton was appointed chairman of the Commission for Revising, a naval budgetary control organization established in December 1804, not long after, after the Earl St. Vincent's departure the preceding year. Henry Dundas, the Vice Count Malville, then the First Lord, was out by May 1805, and Pitt asked Middleton to succeed him. An important consideration was any successor's ability to work with Vice Admiral Lord Horatio Nelson of the Nile. Middleton had first met Nelson, in November 1787, and Nelson had founded Middleton a kindred reformer. Although separated by more than two decades, they had served on the same station as frigate commanders, and corresponded during the American Revolutionary War. Like Nelson, who was an evangelical man, Middleton was distraught by the heavy-handedness of St. Vincent's reforms, not to mention his military mistakes. Knowing a sure thing when he saw it, Pitt appointed Middleton as First Lord, his status in the peerage raised to First Baron Barham of Barham Court in Teston, Kent, with Admiral James Gambier, Margaret's nephew, as the Baron Gambier, First Sea Lord. Middleton dispatched Nelson his reinforcements and tightened the channel blockade in the lead-up to Trafalgar. Afterwards, Middleton was made full Admiral of the Red on 9 November 1805. Known for their proficiency with ship design and defensive mindset, Gambier and Middleton introduced the revised naval regulations of 1806. With Nelson now deified and Pitt soon to follow, at 80 years old, Charles Middleton retired for the last time in 1806. The Lord Barham, Admiral of the Red Sir Charles Middleton, Comptroller of the Navy during the American Revolutionary War, Senior Naval Lord during the French Revolution, and First Lord of the Admiralty during Trafalgar, Frigate Commander in the Leeward Islands during the Seven Years' War, died on 17 June 1813 at the age of 87.